All right. Good evening. I hope you're doing well. Thanks so much for joining me. If you want to put in the chat, I don't know which way to point. I guess it's that way. Um, if you want to put in the chat who you are, where you're from, where you coach, this is an exciting time of year. You might not be, you might be on vacation somewhere and might not be in the same location that you're coaching at. So that's all uh, fun. Here's the deal. It's the end of June and I want to talk about a few things. Oh, I should take a step back. This is mostly Q&A. Okay. I just want to help you tonight. The assumption is you're a high school coach. Um, if we need to deviate a little bit, if there's some high school athletes or some adult athletes, we could get to that, but this is for high school coaches. Okay. It's mostly a Q and a, but before we go into the Q and a, I want to talk about five things that as a high school coach, you should consider as we go into July. Okay. So here are those five considerations. The first thing is the danger zone. This was a concept that, uh, coach Mark Wetmore, my college coach and my mentor would talk about. Now, I talk about in the cross-country training system um, that there's danger zones the first official day of practice in August and then when school starts in August, okay? But the whole month of July, I would say, is a danger zone in, as well. And here's the reason. Volume is increasing and intensity is, is increasing. So when I talk about the term volume, you might be talking about mileage, right? How, how many miles kids are, are running. I like to measure volume in minutes during the... Uh, well, I like to do it all year, but I, I, I think in the summer minutes is really the way to go in terms of uh, changes in heat and humidity, both over the course of the uh, summer and during an individual run or workout. Okay, that could be a a a a question you have as well. But um, volume is increasing and intensity is increasing. Now, if you're saying, Jay, we're not doing race pace workouts, you know, we're not doing repeat miles, repeat thousands, we're definitely not going to the track and doing repeat 400s, I understand that. But as your kids have gotten fitter, as they've been uh, doing more and more post-run work, they're able to handle faster workouts. So even if all you did, I, I mean, no high school program wants to do this, but if you did fart looks on Tuesday, long runs on Friday, and just did those two things all summer long, did strides all, 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 all summer long in all of your run or on all the, the, the days that you're running, your kids would get really fit. And the idea is those fart looks and those long runs will, will be getting faster in uh, July. So that's one thing to keep, to my, keep in mind is that the whole month of July is a danger zone. Okay, because it's a danger zone, you're going to need progressions of volume, of intensity, of strides, and post-run work. So strides, when, when I'm working with athletes and when I'm working with uh, coaches, we're just doing strides at 5K pace. I totally understand the idea that, you know, you might do, an, do a flying 30 on the very first day of practice. I think that's great. I can explain why we're doing them at 5K pace, okay? But the idea is those strides, I mean, if you started, let's say, the uh, second week in June and now you're two weeks into practice and then we've got the 4th of July on Monday, you're going to meet kids on Tuesday this idea that they could, should be able to do their strides faster. Post-run work, it's the exact same thing. They should be able to handle more work now. But you need to have an intelligent progression of all of these things so that you don't have really hard post-run work on the same day that you've got a much harder workout on the same day when their long run is 10 or maybe 15 minutes longer. That would be a bad idea, by the way. You would, wouldn't want to jump up that much, okay? So I'm not going to tell you tonight what your progression should be, but just know that, hey, I've, I've really, and, and you know, here you are on a Wednesday night prior to, uh, prior to July 1st, prior to the July 4th holiday, you might be saying, hey, I need to write out what the next four or five weeks are going to look at like from basically July 4th up until our first day of state sanctioned practice. So you've got to have progressions for all those things. Okay, let's switch gears. Let's talk about kids being on vacation. Here's the deal. They're not going to do everything that you assign. Some kids well. I was fortunate to work with a young man the winter of his freshman year um, prior, prior to going into a, a really fantastic program. And here's the deal. This kid was amazing. And his dad, uh, so yes, yeah, so it was in the winter. This young man was from Illinois and at the beach in South Carolina or Florida or someplace. He's doing Sam, okay? And if you don't know what Sam is, it's just strength and mobility. Probably on YouTube here, it's showing you other videos with strength and mobility. I'll, I'll try and remember to put that in the uh, chat as well. But the idea is some kids are so serious that on their beach vacation at the beach, they're doing Sam and their parents are like, we have to go. We have to get to dinner or wherever. And 
this dad was blown away that his son would do that. This athlete went on to be a Foot Locker finalist. Most coaches aren't going to be coaching a Foot Locker finalist this year. Most, most coaches aren't going to be coaching somebody who just has an insane commitment to this sport. And that's okay. These are high school athletes. They should enjoy the time on vacation with their family, okay? But what you need to, to do is you need to understand that when they come back, you need to, quote, start where they are, right? And what I mean by that is if they, if, if they missed a long run, then the long run based on the progression that we just talked about, you, if, if, if they missed, let's say, the long run that is assigned the week of July 11th, they, and, and July 11th is a Monday this summer, the long run that they're assigned in July 18th, they should not do. They should go back and do the long run that they missed. And does that mean they're a week behind in their long run progression? Yes. But I think the chance of injury goes way up when you try and skip the things that they missed on vacation and keep progressing them them in the same way that their teammates who are showing up for all the practices with you did. Okay. Now, I understand there can be some some nuance to this. Um, if an athlete just missed some easy days, but got in all the all the workouts, got in all the long runs, you know, they were able to do a, a, a threshold run. I actually like doing fart licks and um, progression runs a little bit more. You can ask questions about why. But the idea being, if they got in those hard workouts and you think they're a kid who really likes that post run work, then we might assume that hey, we don't have to um, go completely back to the uh, week they left off. Okay, but. Here's the deal. Uh, I'm going to share this, make this a little bit bigger. This is Magnolia Road. These are not high school athletes. These are actually adult uh, post-collegiate athletes. The guy without his shirt on is Kenyon Newman, a guy from Bend, Oregon, who ran at the University of Colorado. Um, I was fortunate to be an assistant coach at CU when he ran there. And I was fortunate to coach him uh, post, post-collegiately. I don't know why I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that well. Um, for a couple of years. Just a fantastic guy. Works for Nike now. The other guy in the red, uh, Rory Frazier is a guy who ran at the University of New Mexico. But this is just a fun picture to look at. Hey, what does July look like in Colorado? And if you know, you might know that that's Magnolia Road, okay? And the reason I'm highlighting this to you is let's look at the, the flip side of this thing of, hey, if they're going on vacation, you know, Jay doesn't think they'll train. Here's what we know they will do. If they're meeting you at practice in your hometown, they will get in great training. And when I was an athlete in college, for a guy like me who was maybe going to make the varsity, but was going to be right on the edge. Um, the only two times I ever made the varsity, I was the seventh man. And then two years, I was the eighth man. Okay. Um, but the idea being that for a guy like me, if I wanted to make the team July 1st, I had to be in town. So I think this is a great week to tell kids, hey, I understand you have uh, vacations. I understand you have jobs. But here are the days that we're, we're going to meet. And you know, do you have to meet them six days per week? I don't think so. There are some fantastic programs in, um, I'm thinking, you know, a mountain Vista here in the uh, Denver area that meets kids six days a week. I think that's a huge part of why they're so good. But if you just have two or three or four days per week, just tell kids that, Hey, July is the time that we need to meet with our, our, uh, our teammates to make a jump. Okay. Final point. So we have four points and they're mostly about training, but this one's about, those are about your athletes. This one's about you. You have to pace yourself, right? Here we are the end of June, right? We're not even into July next, uh, into July. You've got July and then August and then September, October, November. And there's Nike Cross Nationals now. So maybe you're a team that's going to be running in December as well. But the, the bottom line is you need to pace yourself at least this month. Maybe you're somebody who can bring great energy to practice every single practice August, September, October, November. I would like to recommend that all of July, yes, you're meeting kids and yes, you have good energy, but you're doing some things to take care of yourself. So these next four slides I shared at the Boulder Running Clinics um, in January, because I, I even in January, as we were getting ready for track, I was trying to get coaches to think about, hey, when track is over, let's make sure you take some time off. So you could read some books. Um, these are all great summer books. Rest is a great book about that topic. It, I, I really enjoyed it. 10% um, Happier is a, it, if you told me, Jay, I want to get into meditation. I'm somebody who meditates most days. Um, I had this streak that I was really lucky to be able to do mostly because my kids are older, but I got a thousand days of meditation. Uh, the streak ended last fall, but 10% Happier would be an audio book you could listen to 
Um, that's just fun. Uh, Mary Oliver's a poet. Tom Wolf, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. That's a great summer book. Um, if you want some insight into running with the Buffalo, if you want some insight into Mark Wetmore and running with the Buffaloes, Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test is great. And Travels with Charlie is something I'll be reading this summer for the, I don't know, sixth time in my life because it's just so great. Um, you, could get, you could get a hammock and hang out in a hammock. And God willing, this is what I'll be doing Thursday and Friday with my daughter, uh, my 13-year-old up in the woods uh, in the Holy Cross wilderness, I'll pretend to be reading and sleeping in the hammock, but, you know, camping with your, your kids, things like that. I, I think you just need to say, this is the uh, time of year that take advantage of that in July, because when the season starts and, and many of you, all, almost every program is going to have an influx of new kids into your program. And I think we forget sometimes, man, we have these kids that were meeting us all summer long and they're really invested, but then we have the new kids that show up that first week of practice and new parents, and that gets to be a very hectic time. All right, so um, I'll make this a little bit bigger so that you can can uh, reach out to me. Um, on all the social media platforms, I, I, I go back and forth on Twitter. The days I'm active on it, there's a lot of tweets at coachjjohnson.com. This is my website. Um, you can email me at info at coachjjohnson, and I'll put that stuff in the chat. And then here we go. Oh, and if you're enjoying this video, if you, oh, that looks horrible in the chat, at least from my end. Sorry about that. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put one of those up here. I send an email every Wednesday to high school coaches. Today it went a little bit early and it was about this webinar, okay? But if you go to that link, you can you can get my emails. Um, they are, they're, they're kind of timed throughout the year so that in January, you're getting different emails and you're going to be getting in March, which are different emails than you're getting now, okay? And, and they're just for high school coaches. So those come out on Wednesday. But honestly, if you're watching this, you probably get those anyway. So, okay, here we go. I'm going to go backwards. And all right, uh, we've, we've got some, some people. We've got uh, South Carolina, Florida, Minnesota, Topeka, Kansas, Wisconsin. We got an athlete on here. That's great too. Warren Township High School, Illinois. Okay. Um, there, there's a high school athlete who's got some questions and I'm probably gonna, um, I'm like five weeks into summer training. So coaches, I'm gonna let you go first. And if there's high school athletes that have questions, I can, um, I can answer theirs. And I am doing something for high school coaches um, this summer where it's called the cross-country training system. I'll put that link in here. Um, what it is, is it's a course, um, well, it's a, a system that you're a part of, a system that that you learn how I approach cross-country training. You can, if, if you just want to copy it verbatim, I've got every workout you need. You know, every kids who have done no, what we talk about, no prior training or, or kids who maybe ran track or running, let's say the 400 and the 200 and want to run cross country all the way up to kids who, you know, the first week of practice can handle a 65 or 70 minute long run. We'll get up to 90 minutes and, and more for a long run. So um, check that out if you're interested. OK, so coaches, do you have any questions? You can just type them in the chat and. Uh, OK. S Sebastian, why do you prefer progressions and fartleks during the summer? I use both along with tempo intervals, but I'm curious. That's a great question. That's a fantastic question. So there's a progression of workouts in the way I teach things, okay? And the idea is we're doing a long run, then we're doing a fartlek run, then we're doing a, pro a progression run, then we're doing aerobic repeats. If you said to me, well, wait, shouldn't we be doing threshold runs? And if you said more specifically, shouldn't we be doing threshold runs because all the science says that we're going to make the greatest improvements um, in terms of our aerobic metabolism when we're training right up to um, our, our threshold, not producing lactate, but running really hard. Yes, that's absolutely true. But I think that teaching threshold runs along this continuum, that you have to learn these other types of runs to be able to execute a threshold run really well, okay? Um, so, so this is a very simple question. I'm going to give you a long answer, but uh, hopefully it's a good answer. The idea is, um, I don't know why I didn't have this handy. 
Consistency is key. And consistency is key. We talk about running by feel, okay? And I really believe that running by feel is important all 12 months of the year, but it's really important in cross country. So the long run teaches you to run by feel. In the last 20 minutes, we're going to be doing strides. We're going to be doing four to five to six strides. We'll start with 20 seconds at 5K pace, get up to 30 seconds at 5K pace. If you think about it, if you're running 5K pace in the middle of the long run, when you slow down, you're not going to slow down to long run pace. You're still going to be running faster. So that's a challenging uh, workout. Then a fartlek workout teaches you to run by feel as well. Both those workouts are so crucial. Teaching the skill of running by feel is so crucial um, in June and July because we know in cross country that skill of running by feel, we'll have to use that, right? We won't get accurate 400, 800, 1600 meter splits, right? Even if a coach rolls out the first 400, 800, 1600, let's say it's a really flat pancake, flat course. And it's, so it's more like a 5k on the track. And so, you know, what rhythm you want to run. What if it rains for three days prior to that meet, right? Then we know those splits will all be slow. So coach, um, the idea being, uh, that, that learning to run by feel, if, if this is a Koros watch, which I love by the way, but whether it's a Garmin or a Koros, whatever, if, if the coach says, Hey, dial in six minute pace, dial in six twenty pace, dial in six forty pace. And we're running for uh, 20 minutes, or we're, we're going to do, you know, critical velocity, or we're going to do, you know, um, cruise intervals or things like that. I think when, when you dial into that pace, you're, you're robbing the athlete of the opportunity to learn to run by feel. And they get in 2022, so many serious distance runners are, let, let's be honest, they're a little bit anal about time, right? Their kids taking a lot of AP classes. They're kids who really want to achieve in life. And when you give them that time, if they're not feeling well, and, and let's say working back two weeks ago, they, they, they could run, you know, repeat K's at six minute pace, feeling really good, but they had a stressful day at school boyfriend or girlfriend breaks up with him. Parents are mean to him. I'm a parent. I've never been inappropriate, you know, mean to my kids. Now I I've been, I've been a, a challenging father at times. I'm sure my kids have gone to school stressed, right? Like, like w kids have a lot of stress on them. And I think sometimes hitting six minute pace when, when you have that as something we know they can do, but they're struggling to do it. They either run too hard to hit that, uh, whether it's a cruise interval or, or whatever, um, to run that pace where, where if we let them run by feel, they'd run six, you know, if you had the data on their watch, they'd run 610, they'd run 612, but they'd run those repeat Ks, they'd feel pretty good, and they'd leave the practice feeling good about themselves. Okay, so 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 that's one reason. Final point. Um, in, in a progression of these workouts, John Sipple, whose boys have been fourth at NXN. So this is not a coach who doesn't know what he's talking about. This is a coach who coaches at an extremely high level. He says it's it's difficult to teach high school kids how to do threshold runs um, in an appropriate way. It's just a hard thing to teach. But if you've done long runs, you've done fartlek runs, you've done progression runs, and then I really like aerobic repeats over some of the other types of um, repeats. I like the term repeat versus interval. You can ask me about that. But but the idea being, I think then you could do a threshold run really well because then it's something where they, they know how to run by feel. And then the final point, Coach, is I think that um, – at that point, when the athlete has progressed to doing a threshold run in a very mature way, if they don't feel good at six minute pace, they'll dial it back to 610 and say, coach, I just, I, I would have been running too hard today. I know how this workout is supposed to feel. So running by feel is one of the chapters in here. And I think it's uh, really important. Okay. Um, George Green, this is a great question. Will your consistency is key book be available as an ebook? This is like a design heavy book. So uh, we'll use an example here, you know, like, like these numbers and the way it's laid out. This is not the, the, a Kindle format or an e format is uh, it's made for most books for novels, but the more you put graphics in them, the more, you know, your phone versus your tablet versus your Kindle. Um, they're all going to look They're They're going to look a little bit different. I, I, I love the uh, Kindle app. I use it on my phone. I use it on my iPad, but it looks different. Each book looks a little bit different on there. So George, um, God willing, consistency is key will not be the last book I write. And I've learned, and I, I think it's perfect for high school kids. I, I like that it's square, that it feels different when they're holding it. Obviously I love the title, but I think um, it, it's just an ebook is something that, and, and, and there's cost. One final thing, and then I'll stop about this. You know, I 
finding somebody to be able to format it so it works across all devices um, is not something where I can pay somebody 500 bucks and do that. It's, it's, it's uh, I wouldn't say it's cost prohibitive, but in the to-do list, it's not the next item. Oh, all right. Um, and I'm going to, that was perfect. Big believer in progressions. And I progress everything from day one before I let them loose. So agree with everything you said. Ah, oh, well, thanks for the feedback. You don't have to agree, by the way. I really like this podcast. There's this podcast called the All In Podcast. It's with four billionaires. You're like, Jay, why are you watching a, a podcast with four billionaires? Because you're a track coach, right? But I love the way these guys think. And I love the fact, and, and this is one of the reasons people really love these guys' podcasts, is they can have, they can disagree and they can, and they can disagree enthusiastically with each other, but still respect each other. And the joke is that they're besties. For whatever reason, I don't love that term, by the way, bestie. But uh, they call each other's, uh, you know, the uh, besties, the, 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 the four besties on the uh, podcast. So um, if you wouldn't have agreed with me, that would be fine too. I, d I do worry that I'll get like trolled on these, these live webinars though, when it's like, you know, just open to the, uh, open to anybody. But what's a good game plan for the day before our first time trial? Ooh, that's a good question. So why don't we look at four days? We got the race. We know what we're doing on race day. Um, well, we maybe don't know exactly what we're doing. We should have dialed in the pre-race warm-up, um, coach. We should have done that. We should be doing that now. Like the, the warm-up that we're going to do on race day should be Jeff's warm-up and go to coachjjohnson.com, scroll up into the comments, click on that. When, when you sign up for my email list, you'll get on your phone, you'll be able to watch, um, Jeff's warm, you, not only you, all your kids can have that warm-up on your phone. You can have it. You can teach it to them. Um, I, I could do a, a whole an entire 20 minute segment on a webinar. Why a, I, I think that warm up is, is fantastic. And then B why you should be doing a dynamic warm up. There was an interesting tweet today by um, somebody who knows biomechanics and you know, they don't agree with that. They think we should just go run. But the bottom line is the, the pre-race warm up would be saying the same as the warm up. If we go back to the day before we are from the moment we do that warm up, we are dialed in mentally to, Hey, when we warm up, it's re we are ready to go. And, the, and we want cross country, do, do, we want it to be fun. There should be a lot of levity around cross country practices until we get to the warm up. And especially on a pre race day, we should be focused, okay? Um, day prior, I think this idea of, you know, running the whole course, walking the, the whole course, I think, think that really varies on, on the volume your, your kids can handle. If you have athletes who are doing 60 and 70 minute long runs, they can obviously run the entire course. I don't know if they need to run the entire course. Okay. Um, I don't know if a three mile run and strides and then, um, some post run work is something that you have to do. Okay. And so I'm being a little bit vague here because I, I what, what I don't want to say is Jeff Bolle's warm up, run the course and then do six strides. That being said, I don't think that's a bad idea. I think for some high school athletes, running the whole course is too much um, the, 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 the day prior. Um, but all your kids who would be traveling to the uh, course should, should be able to handle that. Okay. One thing you might be thinking of, hey, should we be doing 200s, 300s, 400s at race pace? Um, that's something I'll be talking about in the cross-country training system. I, I think there's a lot to be said for an older athlete to, to get in some 500s, maybe 300 meters at race pace, and then fast, faster. And um, consistency is key. I talk about fast, faster, fastest. I think in cross-country, we're just trying to run pace and go fast and faster. Fast, faster, fastest is 1,600 meters trying to switch gears three times. Um, feel free to ask, ask questions about that. And then if we go back 48 hours, I think early in the season before your first time trial, I do think that's a time where you, those kids are really well served, um, by doing some race pace stuff. So, so if it's a, whether it's a two mile or 5k time trial, let's run race pace, you know, 400s, 800s, even, even probably not a thousand, but probably some 400s, 500s, 800s. Well, well the reason I give so many distances too, is like, so many people have a park where they can get in a 550 meter loop. That's great. That's your park. When, when I was a coach at Pratt community college, I guess you can't see those photos. I don't have them up there, but we, we had these great parks. We didn't have a track. Okay. Um, we, I came up with a track around the demolition derby race car pit. They would like dig out the pit and then they would basically dig every, or basically push the, the dirt back in at the end of the County fair. 
but because nobody used it the rest of the year, we, I made a, um, 320 meter track. So five laps to a 1600 and, you know, use what you need to use, get in maybe 1500 meters of work, you know, three by 500, um, something like that, or, or four by 500. And again, I'm being vague because there's really, there's really, it's the, the training volume your kids can handle your kid who's training hard now, um, 48 hours prior to the first time trial, which is not important. And, and here's one final thing. We want their legs to have turned over at the pace you think they'll be able to run this time trial at. And if they do that a little bit, 48 hours out, that's a very good thing. Um, is there, is there going to be muscle memory from let's say a Thursday to a Saturday time trial, or, or maybe more likely a Wednesday to a Friday time trial? No, but then they, they, they could have run some race pace stuff on Monday. And one final thing, let's not blow off the uh, time trial. Let's not train through the time trial. You, I'm not saying that they should be completely rested, but if you had a kid who didn't make the, the, the state meet and let's say uh, this year, June 6th was a Monday, let's stay start, starting on June 6th all the way up to, let's say the week of August 8th um, is also a Monday. I mean, that's basically 10 weeks, I, I think. Um, maybe it's nine weeks, but the bottom line is if you have a super serious kid gives them some race pace stuff on Monday, let them turn over a little bit on Wednesday, let them run really hard on Friday because they want to see where they are. They've been training hard all, all year long, not all year long, all summer long. And uh, sometimes I, I think we have kids train through things. And, and then granted, you can get back to training hard after that. Okay. And then another thing, this assumes that you don't have 10 meets on your meet schedule and the time trial is really important. But then they're, they're, you know, you, you can train hard the, the next 10 days and then two weeks later, go, go run a race. Okay, let's look at this. I should, before I bring these up on the screen, I should probably read them. Um, okay. How do you suggest doing an aerobic workout, progression or fartlek during the summer? Is, it, is once a week plenty? Um, Andrew, this is a great question. And I think most people are saying, hey, during the summer, we're going to get three stimuli per week. Okay. It could be a long run, could be a threshold run, could be a hill workout, could be a far look run. What coaches in the cross country training system are doing and what kid, what the small, small number of kids I'm doing that I'm working with this summer. Um, and, and I, I say small because I, I don't work with athletes who have a coach riding training with them in the summer and who's meeting them in, in, in the summer. But Everybody is going to do a workout and is going to do a long run. The long run needs to be really hard. The workout needs to be uh, hard, okay? If you're doing a farlic run or a progression run, um, if you're doing aerobic repeats, if you're doing that once a week and you're getting in a really long, long run, and then at the end of the workout and at the end of the long run, we're doing challenging post-run work. So if you go to YouTube, you can see the SAM videos. In my cross country training system, we, you, you know, the SAM videos are on YouTube for free and they're very good. If you did them, they're great. You will not get hurt. Is it the best stuff that, that I work with? No, because that's what I give athletes and, 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 and coaches who I'm, I'm working with this way. But, but the bottom line is that stuff is at least 20 minutes, even for, even for somebody who's only been training for, for, you know, two or three weeks. They've got 20 minutes of post-run work at the end of the long run, even if the long run's only only 30 minutes. And why is that? Because we're trying to extend the aerobic stimulus. Does that make sense? And so within that 20 minutes, it's not like the whole 20 minutes is killer, but the first 10 minutes is, is very challenging. So what you have in this system, if kids are really doing it well, they go really hard on Tuesday, then they come back with the long run, they go really hard on Friday. You have those two days. Then Monday and... Um, Thursday, the day prior to these workouts, we have a progression of strides. The, the, the first couple of weeks, we're just doing strides at 5K pace. But as the summer progresses, we're getting faster and running 800 meter pace. So those two days are not completely easy days. They, I, I use the term easy, but they're, they're more like easy plus or medium minus, right? Because those strides are a little bit faster. Then we do that. Um, so, so the progression of strides on Monday, workout Tuesday, come back Wednesday is just really easy chat with your friends, you know, just enjoy that easy day. We're still running, po doing post-run work. And again, Jeff's warm up that I've talked about is 13 minutes. If that run is 30 minutes, then you probably have 15 minutes of post-run work, but 13 and 30 is 43 plus 15 is 58. 
if they do one, you know, just one continuous thing where they're not taking any breaks, and if you live in a hot, humid climate, yes, from a safety standpoint, they will need to take some breaks after the run before the post-run work. But if you can, if you can extend that whole aerobic stimulus, they're going to get a 58-minute stimulus that way um, where their heart rate is elevated, m- maybe not in the last five to seven minutes of the post-run work, but, but in, the, in the first five, just even on our easy day, um, they're, they're able to do that. And, you know, if we go back to, if we go back to this slide, um, you need a progression of all these things. And this is a, 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 a fantastic question, but you would have to have a progression of workouts that fits within a progression of strides that fits within a, uh, within a, a progression of post-run work as well. Okay. Um, Okay. I'm four weeks in. Weather's getting way hotter here in South Florida. We've done hills easy twice, all, all the runs, heart rate um, less than 140, two flying 30s, 12 days apart, strides two, two times a week. Um, I want to introduce um, lactate threshold, light 5K, uh, 40 seconds. Should we go with progression or fartlicks first? Um, that's a great question. So, so, so you've done, all, you, you've done faster running for short amounts of time. I think that's great. I think if you weren't in Florida and I know you are, so I, I will, I will answer that. But if, if you were in a, a climate like we are here in Colorado, you could just do a long fartlek run. You could just do a long run. You could do a progression run. Um, who comes to mind is Dr. Jeff Mezer, who I've been, uh, I've been fortunate enough to share some text messages with. The, the, the last, uh, I guess, 24 hours. And, you know, he's somebody who is coaching in the, the, the Phoenix, Arizona area. And instead of doing a 20 minute threshold run, I believe he chopped it into 90 nineties. So they'd run that threshold pace for 90 and either walk or jog for 90 and then run for 90. Because remember, uh, this watch has a heart rate monitor. It's not, my experience is it's not super accurate. There's one under the little watch face here, but so, but I'm realizing after, you know, Basically, after a couple of months being on bike rides, looking at it, I'm like it's way too low. It's 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 way too high. Now I'm just back to wearing that uh that heart rate uh, monitor chest strap. You don't need that on your kids, but if you had them on your kids, what you would find in that type of Florida heat is if you took you know what you're calling an LT, if you took let's say just a t- a 20 minute run and chopped it into 60, 60, 90, 90, maybe they could handle two minutes, one minute. Okay but error on the side of less. And what you'd see is that heart rate's going to stay pretty high the, the entire time. Okay. Um, and, but my, my progression of teaching workouts is long runs and, and in the last 20 minutes are doing strides. If the kids can't maintain that and they blow up that workout, that's fine because they learn to run by feel. Then we do fartlek workouts. Let's say we're doing a three on uh, a three minute on two minute steady fart lick. And let's say we're doing six sets of that. So it's 30 minutes. Let's say they get to the 20 minute mark. They've got two more sets to go. Let's say they blow it up and they slow down. That's great early on because they learn to run by feel. And then, uh, when they get to a, I would say most progression runs, if, if, if kids are doing a, a 20 minute progression run, it's just 10, five and five, 10 minutes at a steady pace, five minutes, a little bit faster, five minutes at a pace that's fast, but controlled. And they have to end that saying, I could have gone, gone a little bit farther. And consistency is key. I talk about farther or faster or both. Farther or faster applies to the long run. And it actually is both in that case. But in the case of the fartlicks and the progressions, kids just need to be able to say, I, you know, in the case of a fartlek, I had one more set. In the case of the progression run, I had at least two minutes. You know, what we really want them to be able to say is five minutes, Okay. But the idea being that if they blow up those workouts early on, when I, you, you know, can't can't go farther or can't run the last couple sets of the far look well, can't run faster on the progression run unless it turns into a race. Which again, that's not what we're doing. The last five minutes is a challenging pace, but it's a controlled pace. Long story short, is um, those three workouts, if they blow them up a little bit when they're learning to run by feel, that's that that's all right. But I like um, that progression of long run to fartlek to progression run. Then we go back to fartleks. By the time we do the second uh, 
let's say by the time we get to about the fourth long run and the second progression run in a, in, I would say in the fourth week of the summer, kids should have a better feel, a, a better feeling for running by feel. If they're brand new, four weeks might 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 be too early. But if you have a, kids who ran with you in track and, and they're doing this th this year, um, they learning to run by feel is a skill that you can expect them to have by week four or five. Okay, um, so I hope that was helpful. Um, yeah. And Andrew says that's what that, that they're doing. Um, uh, doing them once doing, doing a workout per week and a, a long run per, per week. I have to be honest the, when we start this at six o'clock mountain time, I think it's a really good time for people in the central time zone, 7 PM. It's a good time. I think 8 PM in the Eastern time zone. I do way better when when the cross country training system webinars when we start at 9 a.m. Mountain Time, and, and we actually this winter for the track training system we're doing them at 8 a.m. Mountain Time. Um, I'm somebody who's up early, and so my apologies if I stammer a little bit or if I'm not exactly on point. But I, I also think that I want to serve you, the uh, high school coach, and I think this probably fits you better than trying to do it in the middle of the day. Oh, all right. Okay, with, with Sebastian, I work um, my kids up to pushing the second half of the long run example, um, 12 long run, push the last six, last six miles instead of the whole run. Do you believe you get the same benefits from either? Ooh, that's a great question. All right, so I, I do all long runs by time, um, but we let's make this math really easy on us. Um, let's say it's a 12 mile run at seven minute pace. Okay, so what is that? 84 minutes. Okay. And so what you're looking at is 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 basically 42 minutes of them running seven minute pace. Well, um they I don't know why I can't think. They'd be running like 720 pace, right? Maybe a little bit faster. And then that next six miles, maybe they're gonna run 640 pace. I would rather take you know an, an 80 minute run, let's say, and most in in the last 20 to 25 minutes, we want to get in five. Uh, well, for these kids, it's more like six by 30 second strides at 5K pace. Now, if you're paying attention, you're like, wait, isn't that almost like a fartlek in the middle of a long run? Yes. Is that going to be a fast finish long run? Technically, it is because those last 20 minutes are going to be faster. Some people talk about a progression long run. Is it getting progressively faster? For an older athlete, it is. Okay. So with that 80 minute run, First, first 30 minutes can be just probably, honestly, if it's a really serious athlete, we're probably only going to do 20 minutes where it's conversational and, and it's really easy, right? So, so what we're looking at in, in your scenario is about three miles, right? But, but, but let, let, let's use minutes. Let, let's say the, the first 30 minutes is, is going to be easier. We know that the last five minutes, we're, we're just going to run easy. So let's say it's an 85 minute long run. Now we've got 20 minutes. Um, to, well, actually, in this scenario, we're going to say we have 25 minutes to get in those strides. So the last 30 minutes off 85, we've got the 50-minute mark here, and we've got the 30-minute mark here. So um, at 50 minutes, they'll start doing their strides. And then in the first 30 minutes, it can be easy. From 30 minutes to 50 minutes, I think they should speed up, okay? Now, if we were going to graph out... Um, if we're going to graph out what heart rate should do. So there's this idea of, of, not idea. This is a real thing. Cardiac drift, right? Cardiac drift simply means that if you're going to run the same output, um, if, if, if you're going to run at the, at the same perceived effort, let's say over the course of this 80 minute run, if you're in a hot, humid place and it doesn't have to be super hot and it doesn't have to be super humid, but let's say heart rate was, let's say at 150 for an athlete or 160, it'll slowly start to elevate and that 150 athlete might get to 165 or 170. And, and again, this is not in the run we're talking about that does get faster, but the idea is you, you know, a run that would be an even effort. So to, to your question, I mean, I want to see the gradual heart rate increase, but in the summer, I don't want it to go crazy where it's basically turning into a race effort in those last 20 or 25 minutes. So what you have to do at the coach as, as a, a coach, and, and then again, this is what we talked about at the beginning. In July, we have this intersection of volume and intensity. 
you should expect a kid in week four and five of summer training, which is, is going to be in July, to be able to run a long run hard. One of the things I talk about in consistency is key um, is to build your attention span for hard work. And that's one of the things I love about the long run, right? Is that the long run, it's long and it's going to set kids up in July to then do those really hard race pace workouts the uh, rest of the cross country season. But I would say if you graft heart what rate in, in my long run, it's, it's going to go up like that. And I think, you know, if you chopped it into, hey, we're, we're gossiping, we're telling stories the first 20, 30 minutes, but then we're going to get a little more serious. And, you know, one great way, are we talking in paragraphs? Are we talking in sentences? Are we talking in phrases? In the first 20, 30 minutes, we're talking in paragraphs. In the middle part of the run, sentences or phrases. And most coaches would say, oh, we're definitely talking in sentences. It, it, in my approach to, to cross-country training, we're going to run this longer and hard. And then that last 20, 25 minutes um, for, for younger athletes, we're going to get all those strides in just in the last 20 minutes. But in that last part, we can um, assume that they're just going to be talking. They're, they can talk in phrases, but they're not going to want to in, in between those strides. So, um, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, someone just finished high school and I want to be a distance running coach and I don't really know how to start other than going off to college. Should I help out high school coaches? Should I learn more? Um, awesome that you're tuning in tonight. I, you know, I, I'm so blessed that at 46, I've been able to make a living, uh, since I was 24 as a coach, but there is a huge thing missing in, in my ability to coach as a 24 year old at Pratt community college, which was this, I'd never coached before I'd run at the university of Colorado and I'd run in high school. And so when you put that all together, I'd been serious about running for about eight or nine years. And when I say serious, like in high school, I was extremely serious at CU, you know, in CU, we were real serious. Okay. But, and, and I had a master's degree in kinesiology and applied physiology by, by the time I graduated CU. But here I am going into my first day of coaching at a junior college, and I've never coached. I've never coached at a middle school. I've never been an assistant coach at a high school. To me, this one is very simple. Good. There are, I mean, if, if, you, if you type in, you know, what, what city and uh, state you're in, and you might not want to do that, but I guarantee within a 15-minute drive of you, there's a high school program or a middle school program or a USATF youth program that needs a coach, that is dying for a coach. And if you're fired up to be there and just, just, just help that coach, that is the most important thing you can be doing right now. Um, I think education is really important. I mean, it's 2022, things are really changing. When I was a college freshman in 1994, you know, you would study biology, you would study exercise physiology. Um, I'm not convinced you need to do that as much. I mean, you can, I have a, just me personally, I have a ton of, of information on the, on, on the, on the internet about training, but even I was on my stationary bike today, watching some great videos about VO2 max. Right. Um, and I, I will put that in the notes in the comment section. I got to make a note to myself to do that. But, uh, Dr. Peter Atia and Alex Hutchinson, um, who's written the book endure. And it's just a great discussion of VO2 max better than anything. I think I ever learned in graduate school and you can get it for free on YouTube. So hopefully I'm adding to YouTube by doing this tonight, but, um, ho ho hopefully that's some, some help. Okay. Travis, how many days a week should a freshman with no running experience work? Um, can they safely handle six days or should they start at four? Travis, this is a great question. Um, a freshman with no running experience, I don't think running six days a week makes sense. I think, can they be active six or, you know, five or six days a week? Yes. So let, let's, let's tease out running from being active. Okay. And let's talk about running as something that has pounding and is weight bearing because that's in, all right. So in 2022, these kids you're working with, they've watched more television, they've played more video games and they've had a screen most of their lives. If Travis, I don't know how old you are, but as a middle-aged man, and I love the term middle age, by by the way, um, but but I'm I'm of an age where, man, you know, I was playing tennis and riding my bike, and you know, uh, sometimes we played kick the can and capture the flag at night with neighbor kids, and it was awesome. 
that that kind of foundational um, amount of exercise prior to distance running is something coaches could have assumed in the nineteen in in the nineteen nineties. But for you as a coach, you know, in two thousand twenty two, you can't assume that. So it's not, but you can assume that a kid, if they want to be out for your team, is willing to work five days a week for the first three or four weeks of practice and then work six days a week. Okay. Now I think, I mean, as I'm saying, that's one of the, that's one hard thing about doing this live. If they just did five all cross country season long and didn't run Saturday and, and Sunday or and weren't even active Saturday and Sunday, unless they had to meet on Saturday but they have a great experience. Travis, that's what we want out of a freshman, right? But can their body handle six days of activity? Absolutely. Um, I think underlying your question is that you have a feel for, you know, is four days or a right amount of time to run. They can run Monday, Tuesday. They can do some sort of cross training. And, and you and I, obviously, they, we, we know they can do some circuits. They can just do all that, that post-run work we have in the cross-country training system. Then Thursday, Friday, run and run. And then, you know, could tell them, hey, I need you to do, go on a bike ride with your family Saturday, um, and, and, and that would be great. I do think there's something to be said for running faster on Monday with our progression strides, doing a hard workout Tuesday, then letting them take the, the day off from running and going for a bike ride or a swim, something non-weight bearing, doing the same thing Thursday, Friday, going for that, that swim again on, uh, on, on Saturday. Um, cause they will have done the long run Friday and, and I don't think we need them running again Saturday right away, but then obvious to make this simple, then if they can run five days a week, Monday through Friday, um, they'll be great. And they can go for a bike ride, even a brisk walk. I, you, you know, I started using a brisk walk with adult marathoners on Sunday following Saturday long runs. So for you, if they're doing the long run on Saturday or on Friday, we're talking about a Saturday brisk walk and it's such a great thing kids can do. And a brisk walk does not mean walking your dog who wants to sniff. Like this is like 20, 30 minutes of really walking, but it's a uh, great recovery tool. Um, oh, thanks for that. Um, I, Thanks. Thanks so much for, 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 for saying that. I, I really appreciate that. Um, and, and to be clear though, what's up to you is finding that program next. I mean, we're talking on the Wednesday before the 4th of July, you can either do it at the end of this week, but definitely after the 4th of July, find that, uh, local program. Okay. Brian. Oh, Brian, what a wonderful question. He says, some of the middle of the pack kids are struggling staying focused on the post-run work. Is now the time to push them on it or do I give them some grace this summer? Man, if if I, I hate the idea of the art of coaching when it's used um, as a cover-up to not have a plan with coaching, okay? Is my cross-country training system perfect? No, but at least I have this plan that I know will help high school athletes. Um, and, and, and high, well, it'll help high school coaches help high school athletes, but Brian, this is the art of coaching right here. I mean, you know, if, if these are kids who come and say to you, I want to have a great cross country season, then yes, you know, as part of the cross country training system, we have got to knock out post run work and we've got to do it right at the end of those hard runs, the long runs and the workouts. If you've got a newer kid, a kid who is really enjoy, like they, they love popsicles, and they enjoy doing the warm up, and then they're really struggling on the run. Man, I would just do some, you know, I would do five minutes of post run work and say, hey, when the season starts, when August comes, we're going to get going. And and the the, the idea is like build your attention span for hard work. If if I answered the question through that lens, if you think they're already building their attention span for hard work through these workouts. And that the post run work is just a bridge too far. Take that out. But the flip side is, if you have other kids who they're they're telling you they really want to be good, then you need to say, hey, doing post run work is part of this. And man, we're, we're you know soon the world championships will be on television. All those athletes do hours and hours of uh, post run work and have been doing it for years. So one of the things in 2022 that every good athlete is doing is lots of post run work. Okay. And then Brian follows it up. We're in the building phase of our team. Lots of young kids. I don't want to scare them off. Yeah. So hopefully everything I said still applies to this, but I, th I think if you're worried about scaring them off, why don't we have them do the run? Let's do something fun for five minutes, like core X and eh, maybe not even core X because I, I forget this. 
when when you look at Corex on on YouTube, it's a five minute routine, 10, 30 second uh, exercises, but there's no break. <clears throat> when I the moment I just said Corex, I'm thinking 15 seconds with as much rest as you need, which might take seven or eight minutes. Okay. But final thing, Brian, if you just want to um, have them do, you know, the lunge matrix and leg swings, which we know is no more than five or six minutes and call, them, call it a day, I think that's great. One final thing. All of us need to hear that we're loved and cared for and that we're useful, right? Don't forget at the end of practice, and, and if, if you can't do it with every kid every day, I understand that. And we also understand that if, if we say things over and over, um, sometimes they lose their meaning. But I think with a young team telling those kids at the end of practice that they're just working their tail off and that you're so proud of them and that you are empowered, that, 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 that you're filled up as a person by seeing them work that hard. Things like that, I think, go much farther than we uh, realize. Okay, Travis. Oh, this is a great question. Um, and honestly, folks, I, I uh, post any any final ones if you have them. I think this is going to be a great one to end on. Um, I want to make sure I didn't miss any others in here. Okay. All right. Travis says, uh, just a quick follow-up. What sort of mileage minutes should they be uh, shooting for to help build adaptations to handle the stress of running a 5K? If let, let, Let's hop ahead to uh, August, the start of state-sanctioned practice. If you have kids that show up and they've never run before, and then two weeks later is your first 5K, the longest run they should be doing is a 5K. The race is the longest run, okay? Now, let's back this out. Travis, if you have kids who are meeting you on Tuesday, July 5th, and they're willing to, to run four days a week, and 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 you know this, we're going to use circuit workouts. We're, we're not just running as some of our hard workouts. We can do a hard circuit on Tuesday, and we can actually just have them exercising five days. We can have them exercising four or five days a week, but one of those hard days we can have as a circuit I mean, I, I just say at some point they need to run a 5K, and by the end of this season, they need to be able to run a 5K with intensity. If that means you have to run, walk a little bit, but but I I, I really think that that circuits are, are are the way to go, and I think Jeff's warm up counts as aerobic training for every human, but especially the untrained kid. The post run work where they're not doing any pounding, where not only is there not a risk for injury but we're improving the chance that they're staying injury free by doing that stuff. So we've got do those two things bookending the running. If all they're doing for a run is a 10 minute run or a 15 minute run or a 20 minute run, and let's say this is an athlete who's going to run 30 minutes for 5k. And you're like, Jay, they, they're, you know, they're, they're running, they're running 11 minute miles and we're running 20 minutes. They're not even running two miles. Just trust the progressions. The other thing too, is if you have an athlete who's never run they're they're, I mean, this this whole thing is going to be just foreign to them. That we're doing this warm up with skipping. That we're going for a run. That we're doing some strides as part of that day. That we're doing post run work. But as long as they can see a little improvement those first first two three weeks, you'll see in week four five and six when they get a hang of what you know Travis's practices are, they're going to be able to move through that and they're going to gain fitness uh, much more quickly than you might imagine. But you have to keep, you know, we have to be injury free in weeks one, two, three, and then going into uh in, end of to four and five. All right. Um this was was great. Um amen to what you just said. All right. Um personal praise, pats on the back and well earned. Oh, let's put this up here. Um William Mitchell says personal praise, pats on the back and well earned. XC kids are the hardest workers on campus. There's a oh I'm gonna put this in um I'll put this in the notes below. Tony Holler, the Feed the Cats coach, has a great article that he wrote about his good friend, Andy Dirks, the cross-country coach at Plainfield North in Illinois. Andy's a fantastic coach. Plainfield North is a, a fantastic program. And Tony, as this you know nationally renowned sprint coach, talks about how hard cross-country kids work. Okay, we, we, I thought we were done, but we're not. For strength training sessions, what do you suggest? 
Uh, what do you think of afternoon sessions? Two days legs, one day pull, one day push, two core mobility. Um, I'm going to punt on that one um, for a later webinar only because I'm getting a little bit tired and I, I feel as an endurance, <laughs> as us being in an endurance sport, I feel like that's a, a little bit lame. What you can do, um, this will not be the last live YouTube I do. Why don't you go to YouTube now and check out my Sam progression? Okay. I think too often we want to move into the weight room when we need to do the SAM progression. So SAM stands for strength and mobility. Just, just, just put in my name and strength and, and, and mobility. It'll, it'll pop in there. SAM phase one is easy. SAM phase two is easy, but when we get to SAM phase three, it gets pretty challenging. Okay. And four and five take a lot of time and there's a lot of stuff and there's plyos introduced. That's great stuff. If somebody said to me, we, we will never be able to go into the weight room, but we can do everything at the track. Can we be good? I'd say, yes, you can run. You can run so well um, with never going into the weight room as a high school athlete or as a coach, having your, your, your team go in there. The flip side is once you get to Sam, once you get to phase three, I think going into the weight room a couple times a day makes, or a couple times a week makes sense. I believe doing your hard days hard and your easy days easy is what you need to be doing. <clears throat> so following that, it, it, that answers the, the question of what days do we do? We do them after the hard days. What, what lifts would we do after our hard days? We would do leg days after the hard days because our legs are already shot a little bit after doing the workout. And it's, it's still, you know, and this idea of concurrent training, there's a ton of research that, you know, when we do concurrent training, there's huge benefits to that. So I, I, I'm not against going to the weight room after, um, after a workout or a long run, but, I, but I think, too often we think we got to go to the weight room to make a jump as an athlete when really, and, and it's, I, I think sometimes we just think going to the weight room is the, the cool glamorous thing to, to do and doing the stuff out at the field, out at the trailhead, um, out at the, at the track that's in Sam is the uh, precursor to that. I fully believe in this, that we're, we're going to progress, um, So we're going to progress body weight to light external load to heavy external load. So we have a lunge, and then I don't know if you can see this, a lunge with little dumbbells, and then a lunge with some weight on the back loading up the spine. You could argue we should do a front squat um, and not load up the spine. But um, I, I, I think that's great. And Gary, if you follow up uh, the next time we do one of these with some specific questions, I mean, I guess I did answer it a little bit, but, but hopefully that was helpful. Okay, Bobby. As an athlete who just recently got your plan, I'm currently um, five weeks into summer training. Should I start on week one of the plan, long run 65? Um, so Bobby, so your coach is doing the, the uh, cross-country training system? I assume yes, and that's why you have the training. You're going to have to talk to them. Doing a long run 65 um, would be that, – that assumes that in the track season – you were running 70 to 75 minutes for a long run. But um, that's this is a great example, and it's actually a good example to end on 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 tonight. Um, this is this is the 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 type of thing that when you do the cross country training system as a coach, you have all these plans for your athletes. But athletes, you as a coach, you shouldn't be asking a guy on YouTube tonight what plan to be on. You should be asking your coach. Um, yeah, so I, I I hope that makes sense. Brian says, uh, great stuff. I have double the amount of kids coming to summer than I did last year. That's exciting. And Brian, that's a testament to you guys having fun, right? So 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 just keep kids having fun. All right, everybody, thanks uh, for for tonight. This was great, and uh, I'll put the other stuff in the. This is this is the way to stay in touch with me. Is this email right here? When you do that, uh, when when you click on that link. You'll get Jeff's warm up. You'll get a longer document called the four key workouts every runner should do. Um, coaches, that's a great document to give a really interested parent. Um, it, it just explains why do we do long runs? Why do we do far look runs? Why do we do progression runs? Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. And I look forward to seeing you on another one of these.